Um, this has been an area, if you've been following uh, what we've been doing on the channel, of course, uh, Dr. Tanya is uh, talking about very inexpensive, widely available interventions that people can do on their own pre-hospitalization during a, a pandemic. Are you, are you familiar with what we've talked about there on that? You're, you're muted, Dr. Tanya. Just trying to get my settings back. So okay. Okay, please review it a bit for me. Okay, so um, this is one of the things that's fascinated me. And so um, I think that this is a area that is very important because I don't believe that COVID-19 is the last pandemic that we're going to see as a population. Unfortunately, I, I think that these things are on the rise. And the question is, is let's say we have another completely different virus that comes out. I mean, Ebola is always on the forefront in West Africa. We've mm -hmm. got uh, bird flu in China that's always sort of rearing its ugly head. Mm -hmm. um, there's a number of viruses all around the world that seem to be threatening to come. And if we're going to have to wait a year for a vaccine, I mean, at, the, at this point, I think we hit the jackpot with a lot of these vaccines, which are nearly 90% effective. The question is, is what do we do as a population the next time there's another virus coming out? Mm -hmm. And so what I, what I am proposing, in, and uh, I leave it to you uh, to look into these things as well, what I propose is to come up with solutions that would work regardless of the virus, because the, the final common denominator in all of this is, is not the virus, but it's the body's immune system's response to the virus. So if you start to study the immune system, what you'll start to see and know is that for a virus to be successful in uh, getting into the human body and doing what it needs to do, it has to bypass a number of, of uh, barriers that the, the immune system puts up. And so in the case of SARS-CoV-2, we knew very early on the, the immunologists knew that one of the major ways that SARS-CoV-2 gets a foothold into the body is by suppressing that portion of the immune system called the innate immune system. Yeah. And specifically, it suppresses the macrophage's ability to secrete interferon. Interferon is a ex very, very important uh, known as the interferon response. There's different types of interferon responses. There's a type one, type two, type three. I don't want to get into the details of that, but to understand that very clearly now, we understand that SARS-CoV-2 proteins, the proteins in SARS-CoV-2 that are, that are made during an infection suppresses the body's ability to secrete interferon. And as a result of that, more cells are infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus so that when the adaptive immune system comes online seven days later, mm. it finds that there are many more cells that are infected and therefore the cytokine response is much more amplified. If the innate immune system had done its job and reduced the amount of cells that were infected, the adaptive immune responses magnitude would be much less and therefore the patient would not have to be admitted to the hospital. That's kind of it in a nutshell. So when they, when, and there was a couple of papers that were published in prestigious journals like science that looked at this, mm -hmm. they followed patients who had inborn errors of genetics that crippled their uh, interferon response. And they noticed that in all of those types of patients who came down with COVID, all of their responses were very severe. There were no patients in the mild category that was published uh, a number of months ago. They also looked at in patients who had antibodies against their own interferon. All of those patients, when they had COVID-19, had severe cases. In fact, they, the authors of the, of the paper that was published said that they could explain 14% of all of the severe cases in their cohort just based on those two examples. And of course, there's probably many other examples where um, uh, interferon levels are reduced. And, and so uh, there's other studies that showed that the higher the interferon response early on in the course of the disease, the better the patients did. And th this should not come as a surprise to you. As you may know, we're actually able now with modern medicine to cure hepatitis C, 
with elevated levels of interferon. Pegylated interferon is now a, uh, a, um, a, a, a viable option for patients with hepatitis C, a chronic infection. And so this shouldn't come to a, as, as to a surprise. So the question in my mind was, is there ways that we can improve or enhance our body's ability to uh, make uh, in interferon? And, and the answer to that question is uh, absolutely. If you were to look at people who have come down with COVID-19 or, or SARS-CoV-2 infection, 80% of those patients never need to go to the hospital. 80% of those patients stick it yes. out and they do well at home. It's only yeah. about 20%. And so instead of focusing on the 20% and trying to fix those, let's see what worked in the 80%. And in those cases, it was certainly the interferon response. Um, and so uh, let uh, one of the things that uh, I researched on this was uh, something that they've looked at where they, where they actually took monocytes out of the human body at various temperatures exposed it to a mitogen, which is something that stimulates the macrophage, and they simply measured the interferon response from the macrophage. Very simple experiment. When, when they started to increase the temperature, the amount of interferon response didn't really change until they hit 39 degrees Celsius, and there was a tenfold increase in the interferon response. Now, this should obviously make you think about a fever. And, and so the first thing that I asked my nurses to do in the hospital was if a patient has a fever that's less than 103, mm. don't treat it. This is something that uh, nurses, at least in our country, love to do is if a patient has a fever, then mm. that's a number that's not where it should be. Well, we need to give Tylenol. We need to give paracetamol, something that's going to bring that temperature down. Mm. And in fact, I believe and looking at the research is that a fever is the last cry of the immune system trying to deal with this. And what we do is we take the rug out from under it and in, in many cases uh, make it worse. Mm -hmm. So I started to look at history and, and this is something that's maybe specific to, uh, this story is specific to the United States, but I can, I can guess, I'm willing to bet here that you have a very similar story uh, in your country. And in fact, what I've noticed is, is people have very similar stories in, in all of their countries around the world. Let me give you the story real quick. So in 1918, we had the pandemic, uh, 1918, 1919 uh, influenza pandemic. And it was particularly bad in the United States because it was at the end of, of the First World War. And our soldiers were coming back from Germany, unfortunately bringing this flu with them. And when they came back, they were interned in these army camps. Mm -hmm. And so the army camps were these huge uh, uh, troves of influenza, in many cases, 20% of the people in these army camps came down with influenza and there was a high mortality rate. And these were very young people. These were people in their twenties and their thirties. Um, at that time in 1918, 1919, we had, uh, we had something called, we had, we had hospitals in our country, especially in the Northeast, but they were a very different kind of hospital. They're now known as sanitariums. And these were where people would go to get rest. They, these people would go there to get to, to de-stress. Uh, they would uh, maybe uh, indulge in some uh, hydrotherapy, things mm. of that nature. These, these sanitariums were run by a, um, a, a religious organization called the Seventh-day Adventist Church, who strongly believed in, uh, at that time, in natural remedies and in and a lot of the things that uh, we, we actually now have some science to back up. So they believed in, in sunshine exposure, in fresh air in rest and, and these sorts of things. And so uh, the medical director of one of these sanitariums in the Northeast, a guy by the name of Dr. Uh, Wells Rubel, uh, was, they were treating some of these patients with influenza and they wanted to compare their uh, track record with those in the army camps. So he looked at the army camps and he found that there was really two phases to this disease, no surprise, very similar to coronavirus. There was the phase where they would come down with the symptoms, fevers, chills, night sweats, and then they would get pneumonia. That was the first phase. And then there was the pneumonia phase to the end when they would potentially die. So he looked at that and he found that um, in the army camps, that, that a, a fairly high proportion of these patients, 16% of these patients came down with pneumonia. And what was the standard of care in these army camps? It was aspirin 
and it was uh, the treatment of, of a lot of the symptoms. But they were inside these these uh, army camp, camp barracks. They were not given. Uh, they were not exposed to fresh air. They were not exposed to sunshine. Uh, they were the beds were lined up very close to each other. Now contrast that with what Dr. Rubel was doing in the sanitarium. So when these patients would come down with symptoms, they immediately were isolated into their rooms. They did were allowed to go outside to get sunlight, fresh air. Um, and they were given something called hydrotherapy. Now, let me explain a little bit about what hydrotherapy was. This is where very uh, hot heated water um, was used to uh, take towels and uh, the, the towels were dipped in this and they were wrung out and they were protected with another uh, towel so that it didn't burn the patient. And the patient was wrapped up completely in these towels, essentially to bring up the core body temperature. Uh, in these patients. And this was done for a, a number of days and they were given rest and all of these sorts of things and nutrition. And at the, uh, at the end of that, maybe only about uh, 3%, 2 to 3% of these patients uh, came down with pneumonia. Now, once the, in either case, the army camp and the sanitarium, once they came down with pneumonia, there was about a 50% mortality. This is prior to antibiotics. This is prior to a lot of the advances that we have. And so here you can see that the number one, the key was, so, so at the end of the day, the mortality rate in the army camps was about, uh, you know, 10%. And the mortality rates in the sanitariums was close to 1%. So much better uh, mm -hmm. treatment. But the key was not after treating the pneumonia, because in either case, the mortality was about 50%. The key was identifying the illness as soon as possible, isolating that patient, giving them, and it's, and it's very interesting to me what they were, because they were giving them sunlight, which we know creates vitamin D. Vitamin There's a whole D talk good. about vitamin D. Number two, they were given fresh air. And we know that uh, most of these sanitariums in the Northeast were in, not in the cities. They were actually in the country where there's a lot of trees. And we've, mm. science has now shown that there's a lot of phytocides and, and, and uh, um, uh, aromatic compounds that trees secrete that can actually be immunogenic. Mm. Number three, they were elevating their body temperature, which was most likely giving a, a larger uh, interferon response and then staving off this cytokine storm at the end. Um, so they were doing everything that was right. And, and nothing that they did in these sanitariums, nothing that they did in these sanitariums is something that you would have to go to the hospital for. You can do this all at home. Mm -hmm. You can do these sorts of tr treatments. And so um, we've been, uh, at least on our channel, showing people, giving them information. There are a number of organizations out there that have videos of how to do hydrotherapy. You know that the, the Finns uh, like to go into their saunas and they have great uh, data that shows that this proves that this improves all cause mortality. Um, and then what I was talking, I, I've been talking to people from all over the world and, and whether it's uh, Australia, whether it's Asia, whether it's, I talked to some people from Iran and they would tell me the same things that whenever they got sick, their mom would do some sort of a thing of, of, of increasing their, either putting them, putting them in bed and making them hot, or I've heard from even uh, some people in the Middle East where they would put them in hot sand, uh, the hot sands of the desert would uh, to heat their body up. But it's, it's very fascinating to me, just teleologically, how mm -hmm. every single culture seems to have their way or their version of heating people up when they're having an illness. And I just can't help but think that this is potentially a, a good way, regardless of the virus, of, of treating some of these things. So I leave that for you there uh, to think about. Yes. So Sarah had her hand up for quite some time now. Sarah? No, thank you so much. It's, it's, my questions have evolved so much. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's, it's, you know, coming back to the philosophy topic, thanks to Tanya, we had Dr. Hoffman with us from UCSC um, last weekend. And he, he, t he coined a term saying evolving psychology. And I've been mulling over it because, you know, this is so new as human beings, we need the human touch, the human contact. And I used to get really angry at those people who were not wearing masks and everything. But now I, I feel that humanity is, it's, it's a, it is at a strange junction, you know, some people need to have that human touch. So evolving psychology, the anti-vaxxers, the anti-maskers, 
um, I've started treating them a little more tolerantly. <laughs> I thought I thought only the U.S. had uh, anti-vaxxers and anti-maskers. Do you have them there too? <laughs> ah, wow! Don't you know Mr. Gates is supposed to be putting chips uh, <laughs> in our? So in Sarah our actually country. lives in the U.S. So okay, okay, yeah. all right. <laughs> but well, Texas, so you can understand the the level of hate I had when I was going around it all gloved and masked and everything. But, but you know, even uh, in Pakistan, we had this. Equivalence. Yes. Um, when you boil it, um, and this just shows that when you boil it down, the, the human nature is uh, transcendent of borders. Yeah. It is, it is. There's so many familiarities. And um, one or two myths that we had um, in our part of the world, South Asia, and I would love to hear your take on it. Initially, um, when the virus was doing it rounds uh, last year in the summer, um, Pakistan managed to evade it quite successfully because of smart lockdowns. Because when you look at South Asia or the developing parts of the world, you know, most of the people or majority of them are local daily wage earners. So it, it was a very um, tricky part for the government either to have lockdowns and have civil unrest because so many of the people are dependent upon daily earnings. Um, but yeah. a theory at that time that was going around was that the fertility rate in South Asia last year was not that much because uh, of the BCG vaccine and the prevalence mm -hmm. of malaria. Mm -hmm. So uh, is it an urban myth or is there any science behind it? Um, well, things have really changed this year. But initially, this, these stories were going around. If we had BCG, that's, uh, I think, um, and the MMR, um, you know, against tuberculosis and all those vaccinations and the robust uh, immune system because people are crammed together. And so I would love to hear your take on that. And secondly, not taking anything away from the CDC. They resisted the previous administration's attempt to inject bleach in us. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they, they did a brilliant job. I hope that doesn't become my adopted land's uh, home red remedy, you know, cleaning our babies with Lysol and putting bleach in them. <laughs> but um, the point is the CDC, two, three days back, it says fully vaccinated people cannot spread the virus. And if I remember correctly, two days later, they retracted. So like um, we have some vulnerable population in the house, like kids. Um, so what uh, what would your take be on that? Thank you so much. Yeah, well, lots of good questions there. So I, I'll just, um, well, um, so I'll, I'll say interestingly that uh, that I am also a uh, uh, an immigrant to the United States, although I came from Canada. Uh, but you know, uh, that's they say. You know, what's your background? Oh, I'm Canadian. That, that doesn't say anything, right? Yeah, to us, you <laughs> all look the same. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, actually, you'll be interested yeah, in North to know America. That, that, but, but you'll be interested to know that um, um, my father, well, my mother is English, my father's from Trinidad, and my dad's uh, background actually is uh, goes back to Pakistan. Um, really? My great, yeah, my, my great grandfather was, uh, well, actually, my, yeah, my great grandfather was a little boy on a boat from P current day Pakistan, at that time it was India, uh, to the New World as an indentured servant. And, yeah, you and look so, a bit so, like us, you know. <laughs> you do. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That's exactly what I was thinking. But you know, yeah, all you the did, this could have been my cousin. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so they used to even speak Punjab in in, in Trinidad, which is where oh, they went wow. to. And then, um, uh, and then there was a lot of Trinidad. If you don't know, is a is a Caribbean island with all sorts of of influences. It was Spanish, and then it was. English, but then the French uh, uh, populated it after the revolution. So I have, uh, I have uh, French nobility uh, in my blood, but I also have a Pakistani indentured servant. And then my mom is English. So I'm just all mixed up. So yeah. I, uh, yeah. um, anyway, I, I, I hear what you're saying about your, your adopted country. I'm sorry, I have to invite myself over to your house for dinner or lunch because Creole cooking with all those. <laughs> Yes. yes. And then so, once so this is over, got... we have to invite you to Pakistan too, because okay, it is yes. one of your native so, lands, right? 
<laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so roti and dalpuri and uh, melange well. and all that. That's West Indian stuff. So. <laughs> yeah.